We're going to look at Federalist 76. Uh, sorry about the lighting, it's a little dark. Uh, when we read the first paragraph, you'll pretty much uh, know what this paper is going to be about. It's kind of continuation of the last paper. Uh, the first paragraph says, the president is to nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments, whose appointments are not otherwise provided for in the Constitution. But the Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone, or in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies which may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, the power, the president has the power to appoint people like ambassadors and judges to actually nominate them. But um, Senate comes in and with the advice and consent of the Senate, that person gets their position, gets their job. Uh, again, remember, this is a question of checks and balances, separation of powers, because here he's going to say, well, if we exclusively gave this right to the president, if the president had the right exclusively to do this, then it might just be a little dangerous. We're trusting too much in this one person. If you were to give it to the legislative side, then usually party politics, factions take over, and you really will not get the fit person to actually either not, uh, either be a candidate for the position or you're not going to be able to just find any, anybody with merit that would want the job. So this way, again, um, by letting the president pick a person, nominate that person, and then the Senate uh, give it consent and approval, then you've actually uh, made it less partisan. You tend to appoint wiser people to the position, or at least this was the, uh, uh, what they wanted to do at the time of the founding. As we know these days, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, factions back then, as they, they would have said, or uh, partisan politics, has, uh, has darkened uh, this, ac this aspect of um, the nominating and approval process of these uh, candidates. Um, so, uh, and uh, like I said, when we go through the Federalist Papers, when you read all of them and delve a little deeper, study American history, American civilization, then what is happening right now is will make more sense to you. Uh, but at this time, we're going to focus on these important papers. Uh, the next paragraph, I'll just go ahead and read it for you. It has been observed in a former paper that the true test of a good government is its aptitude and tendency to produce a good administration. This cannot be overemphasized. Remember, Hamilton especially is, always wants to talk about energy in the government. You give it a responsibility, don't tie the hands of the government, let it do its job. Uh, you, and you have to give it all the tools it needs and you have to let it do its job. Energy, energy, stability, stability. These are the words that constantly come up. Energy, stability, and then on the other side, liberty and uh, people's rights. Uh, 
So here, let me read the sentence again because it's pretty important. It has been observed in a former paper, we've talked about this, he says, in another Federalist paper, that the true test of a good government is its aptitude and tendency to produce a good administration. If the justness of this observation be admitted, the mode of appointing the officers of the United States contained in the foregoing clauses must, when examined, be allowed to be entitled to particular commendation. It is not easy to conceive a plan better calculated than this to promote a judicious choice of men for filling the offices of the Union. This is the best way uh, to fill these offices. This is the way that we have come up with in this Constitution. And, we'll, and it will not need proof that on this point must essentially depend the character of the administration. I'll go to the next paragraph. It will be agreed on all hands that the power of appointment in ordinary cases ought to be modified in one of three ways. So we have three ways of nominating these people for these important positions. In, it ought either to be vested in a single man or in a select assembly of a moderate number. So either we give the responsibility to one person or to a small assembly with, a, he says, a moderate number. Remember, he constantly says, if if the assembly is too large, passions and chaos takes over. So a moderate number or in a single man with the concurrence of such an assembly. So we've chosen the third way. The single man, a single man, the president nominates, tries to point, and the small chamber, which in this case is going to be the Senate, will give concurrence, will approve. The exercise of it by people at large will be readily admitted to be impracticable. We can't just put this nomination in the hands of general public, or for that matter, even, he doesn't say it here, but it indirectly alludes the House of Representatives is not a good place. As he said in the last paper, he says there's too many people. He used, it, he used the word multitudinous and fluctuation. Remember stuff that he doesn't like at all. He likes the stability. He doesn't like fluctuations, up and down, up and down. As waiving every other consideration, it would leave them little time to do anything else. When, therefore, mention is made in the subsequent, subsequent reasonings of an assembly or body of men, what is said must be understood to relate a select body or assembly of the description already given. The people collectively from their number and from their dispersed situation cannot be regulated in their movements by that systematic spirit of cabal and intrigue which will be urged as the chief objections to reposing the power in question in a body of men. And then the next paragraph, those who have themselves reflected upon the subject or who have attended to the observations made in other parts of these papers in relation to the appointment of the president will, I presume, agree to the position that there would always be great probability of having the place supplied by a man of abilities at least respectable. Permissing this, I proceed to lay down as a rule that one man of discernment is better fitted to analyze and estimate the peculiar qualities adapted to particular offices than a body of men of equal or perhaps even of superior discernments. So here he, again he says, let's one person choose who this person is going to be who he or she is going to appoint, then give it to the hands of a small assembly to approve or disapprove it. He says, it's usually we've worked, we've found out over the years by experience that this is the best way to do this thing. 
So constantly remember, uh, when we read these papers, uh, what they have in mind is setting up a system and agreeing that even if good people run for office and get that position, because power corrupts, we have to set up a system that even the person that we thought was a good person, when he got in the office, when she got in the office, uh, there's a good chance that they will be corrupted by power. So we'll set up this system in a way that one person or small group will not ruin the whole experiment. So we'll have division of power, checks and balances, judicial independence, election at certain uh, intervals that cannot be changed. President cannot change the election times. Congress cannot. It's already said in there. If, yes, if there's a special election, somebody dies or somebody retires or um, resigns, that's a different story. But uh, the whole system is set up in a way that um, with this in mind that power corrupts regardless of who it is that you put in a position of power. So set up the system in a way that they cannot ruin the whole society. They cannot destroy your liberties. So keep that in mind as we read this, these papers.